Welcome to this tutorial on drawing inferences about two population means in the case where sigma is unknown. When we say sigma is unknown, what we are saying is that we do not have the population standard deviation or any historical data that can help us determine the population standard deviation, but rather we are computing the standard deviation from the given sample data. Since we are using the sample to compute the standard deviation, we will be using S and not sigma, since sigma, the population standard deviation, is not known. So in the case of sigma unknown, we use S instead of the Greek letter sigma, and we will use a t-table instead of a z-table. So in this tutorial, we will be drawing inferences about the difference between two population means, mu1 and mu2, for sigma1 unknown and for sigma2 unknown. We will be drawing inferences about the differences between two means using a confidence interval approach and also hypothesis testing. Let's begin first with interval estimation. If you recall from previous tutorials, the way to create an interval is to first calculate a point estimate and then add and subtract a margin of error. So an interval for the difference between two means would be x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus and minus some margin of error. The complete formula is shown here. The piece to the right of the plus and minus sign is called the margin of error. The piece to the left is called the point estimate. By adding and subtracting a margin of error, we will get an interval with a lower limit number and an upper limit number, thereby creating an interval. This formula should look familiar to you. We had a similar formula for the case of sigma known. But here we have a t value we need to look up in the t table instead of the z table. And also we are using s instead of sigma since the standard deviation is coming from the sample and not known from the population. Let's take a look at this long and wordy problem. I wrote it out long and wordy to get you more familiar with word problems and how to decipher the wording since that's where most students have trouble. Okay, let's look at this example. Suppose we have two groups of students, those who go for tutoring help and those who do not. A sample of 50 students revealed that 22 had gone for tutoring help. The average grade for students who received tutoring help was a 78 with a standard deviation of five points and the average grade of students who did not receive tutoring help was a 72 with a standard deviation of six points. What is the 95% confidence interval on the difference between these two groups of students? First, we need to determine what we are doing, drawing a confidence interval or testing a hypothesis. We're not trying to prove anything here, so this is not a hypothesis test, and the question clearly asks to create a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, so that's what we need to do. We can also see from the first sentence that there are two groups of students, so we have two population means. And finally, we need to determine if this is the case of sigma known or sigma unknown. Well, do we have the population standard deviation from historical data? Or is it a known process? Or is the standard deviation obtained from the sample? And since it says a sample of 50 students showed, right, then obviously the standard deviation is from the sample. So it is S, not sigma. And so this is the case of sigma unknown. Before we go any further, let's define mu1 as the mean of population 1, students with tutoring, and mu2, the mean of population 2, students without tutoring. What we need to solve this problem is n1, n2, x bar 1, x bar 2, s1, and s2. From the problem, we see that n1 is 22. Now we need to get n2, and we need to think a little. Sometimes the numbers are not given directly in the problem. You have to infer them from the problem. So if we have a sample of 50 students, and 22 went for tutoring help, then 50 minus 22, or 28, did not go for tutoring help. And so n2 is 28. The rest of the numbers come easily from the words of the problem x bar 1 is 78, x bar 2 is 72, s1 is 5, and s2 is 6. Now we are ready to calculate the confidence interval estimate. Here's the formula again and the numbers, so we can just go ahead and plug them in the formula. Okay, so here are all the numbers plugged in, but we are still missing the t value. 
That presents a bit more of a challenge since we need to look that number up in the t-table. If you remember how to use the t-table to look up the number, you must have two things, the alpha value and degrees of freedom. Okay, alpha is 0.05 since we want a 95% confidence interval. And since this is an interval, which implies a tail area above the upper number and a tail area below the lower number, then alpha is split in half. Alpha is always split in half when we are creating confidence intervals. So alpha divided in half is 0 0.025. Now we need to calculate the degrees of freedom. Here is the formula for degrees of freedom. As you can see, it's a little trickier than for one population where we simply took n, the sample size, minus 1. This formula works for the cases where we don't know if the variances are equal, so we need this messy looking formula just in case the variances are not equal. If the variances were equal, we could simply take n1 plus n2 minus 2 and get 22 plus 28 minus 2, or 48. But we can't do that unless we know for sure that the variances are equal, and that's a whole other test. So let's stick with this messy looking formula. Okay, so let's start on a fresh page and begin by plugging in the numbers. And that would look like this. You can see in the numerator I squared S1, which was 5, so now it's 25, and I squared S2, which was 6, so now it reads as 36, 6 times 6, or 6 squared. Now for the numerator, you need to first divide 25 by 22, and then 36 by 28, and then add up those two numbers, and then square the sum to get the numerator. If you do the calculations out of order, then you will get the wrong answer. The same is true for the denominator. Remember the phrase, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, or PEMDAS, however you learned it. It means first do what is P in parentheses, then E exponentiation, then M and D multiplication and division, and then A and S addition and subtraction, PEMDAS. So do the calculation piece by piece and then add everything up, and you should get 5.8671 for the numerator over 0 0.1230, and that is 47.7. That's our degrees of freedom. The quick and dirty way I mentioned before would be to add up the two sample sizes and subtract 2, so 50 minus 2 is 48, but this is the more correct method to use. So now we have alpha divided in half of 0 0.025 and degrees of freedom 47.7. We are ready to look up the number in the t-table, but first I'm going to round 47.7 to 50 degrees of freedom, since my t-table is a condensed version and doesn't have 48 degrees of freedom. It jumps from 40 degrees of freedom to 50 degrees of freedom. There are more comprehensive tables with all the numbers, and of course Excel will give you an exact number, but for our purposes we will use the condensed table and round 47.7 to 50 degrees of freedom. So here we have the condensed table. The longer table would not fit on one slide, so we will have to make do with this table. Okay, so now look across degrees of freedom 50 and down alpha divided in half of 0.025 and we get 2.009. So that is our T value that we will use, 2.009. So back to our equation, let's plug the 2.009 in, and then we get 6 plus and minus 2.009 times 1.5563, which gives us 6 plus and minus 3.1266. Now when we add and subtract, we get a lower number and an upper number, which is our 95% confidence interval, and that is written like this. We are 95% confident that the true difference between mu1 and mu2 is somewhere between 2.8734 and 9.1266. Okay, now we are ready to see how a hypothesis test would be done. Let's use the same example, but instead of drawing a confidence interval, here we will be looking for proof or evidence of something. The professor is looking for evidence that mu2 is less than mu1. In other words, the students from population 2 scored lower than the students from population 1. So if mu2 is less than mu1, then mu1 minus mu2 would be a positive number or greater than 0. 
And so that is what the professor is trying to find evidence for, that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. If it is, then that would mean that the average for population one is higher than the average for population two. Now the first step in hypothesis testing is to state our null and alternative hypotheses. Remember, the alternative hypothesis is what you are looking to prove or what you are looking to find evidence for. So let's state the alternative or research hypothesis first. And since we are trying to prove that students who go for tutoring have a higher average than those who do not, we have an alternative hypothesis that says mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. The null is always counter or opposite to that, so that would be mu1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to zero. Now look at these hypotheses and tell me, is this a one-tail test or a two-tail test? Well, since it's focusing on a direction, it is a one-tail test. And since the area of focus is the greater than side, right, look at the sign in the alternative hypothesis, it is a greater than sign, then this is an upper tail test, so the area of rejection would be the upper tail area. Our next step after stating the null and alternative hypothesis is to calculate the test statistic. This is the formula for the test statistic. Remember that d naught in the numerator is the hypothesized value of the difference between the two means, and it is zero in this case. It is usually zero. So we have 78 minus 72 in the numerator divided by the square root of 5 squared divided by 22 plus 6 squared divided by 28. Remember to square 5 first, getting 25, and then divide by 22, and square 6, get 36, and divide by 28. And then you add those two numbers, and then you take the square root. And we get 6 divided by 1.5563 which is 3.8553. That is our test statistic. Now we can either solve this using the critical value approach to hypothesis testing or the p-value approach. We're going to do both, but let's start first with the critical value approach. So our next step is to look up the critical value. Let's use an alpha of 0.05, and since we already calculated degrees of freedom when we did the confidence interval, we don't have to do it again. You remember degrees of freedom was 47.7 and we rounded it to approximately 50. Alpha is 0.05 and we don't split it in half since this is a one tail test and alpha is all in one tail, the upper tail. So we have alpha 0.05 and degrees of freedom 50. Okay, here's the T table and we're ready to look up our critical value. Using degrees of freedom 50 and alpha 0.05, we look across and down and we get 1.676. This is our critical value. So we calculated our test statistic as 3.8553, and we got a critical value of 1.676. So now our next step is to compare the test statistic with the critical value. We want to see where on the distribution the test statistic falls, in the rejection region or the non-rejection region. So we mark off the critical value here as a boundary or a cutoff point, and then we look at the test statistic of 3.8553 and think about where it falls on the distribution, and it falls somewhere around here. So we can see that it is in the upper tail area, clearly above the critical value. Our next step is to come to a statistical conclusion based on this result. We can say one of two things either reject the null hypothesis or do not reject the null hypothesis. Never say accept the null, since that's not what we set out to prove. We were looking for evidence to prove the alternative hypothesis. So we find evidence for the alternative, which we did here, and our conclusion is reject the null hypothesis, and we can conclude that there is evidence that students who go for tutoring do better than students who do not. What we just did was called the critical value approach, we can also solve this hypothesis test using the p-value approach. To do that, we need to look up the test statistic of 3.8553 in the t-table. The conclusion using this approach will be the same as the critical value approach. It's just a different way of doing the same thing. Okay, so let's look for the test statistic in the t-table. Looking across degrees of freedom 50, 
we see the numbers are first 0.679, then 0.849, then 1.47. Okay, move along where it says 50 degrees of freedom, and you can see it says 0.679. So move down that row and across, and you'll get to 2.937, then you'll get to 3.261 and then 3.496, and then we run out of numbers. Again, we're trying to look for the test statistic of 3.8553 across 50 degrees of freedom. And when we get to the last number in that row for 50 degrees of freedom, we see 3.496. So we actually run out of numbers, and our test statistic of 3.8553 would actually be off the chart around here. Now I realize it's off the chart and there's a reason for that because if you look up you will see that the alpha value, the area under the curve, also gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we move from left to right. Look at that top row on the left. The first number is 0.25, right? And then you have 0 0.20, 0 0.15, 0 0.10, 0 0.05, 0.025 and it keeps going until we get to 0.0005. And this number, this test statistic of 3.8553, would be right after that 0 0.0005. So the p-value would be very small, and it would be certainly less than 0 0.005. To use the p-value, we always compare it with alpha. Now remember, alpha was 0 0.05, and it's clear the p-value was off the chart, and it would be less than our alpha value of 0 0.05. Remember, the rule for the p-value approach is to reject the null if the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha value, and do not reject the null if it is greater than alpha. So our conclusion would be the same as before. We reject the null hypothesis, and we find evidence that students who go for tutoring have a higher average than those who do not. That concludes this tutorial on the difference between two population means when sigma is unknown. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I hope you learned something.